Hello and welcome. I'm Sam Califer, your host for Vision, the show where we talk all about the College of Arts and Sciences as well as its faculty and students. Today I'm joined by Dr. Joseph Thompson, an assistant professor from the Department of History. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Sam. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on and talk about your research. Uh, but first, I was hoping you could just tell me a bit about yourself and how did you come to study your field of expertise? Yeah, so I received a PhD in U.S. History from the University of Virginia in 2019. Um, prior to that, I got a, uh, I earned a master's degree in a program called Southern Studies at the University of Mississippi. Mm. Sorry. No, that uh, was fine. <laughs> and before that, I received a, a BA in American Studies and Anthropology from the University of Alabama. Um, and that's, um, I, give, I tell you those degrees just to say I, I come from a very interdisciplinary background. Mm -hmm. So um, in my, my book, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second, I combine a, a, the study of political history as well as the study of, of music's history, popular music's history. So um, that's very much reflective of the kind of training that I received along the way in those programs. Sure. Yeah, yeah and so you, a big part of your research is music. That's right. And that's so interesting. I mean, what, what drew you to music, if you had to say? Yeah, um, well, <clears throat> I, my, my love of his, of, of of music and uh, the history of music goes back to when I was a kid. Uh, I was the the kid who was studying liner notes of tapes and CDs, uh, sure. um, and and memorizing those who produced what and who played on what records and this kind of thing. So it's a bit of a, a music nerddom, I would say, sure. that that led me into this. At the same time, I grew up in a family that very much valued history. Mm -hmm. uh, so our our family vacations were to Civil War battlefields oh, wow. and and museums and this kind of thing. So. Uh, while we were making those tours, I was in the back, you know, with my headphones on, sure. studying liner notes. And so it, it sort of makes sense that I ended up where I did in terms of my career. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think for someone to study the history of music, it, it comes from a place of passion. And mm -hmm. so something that, I mean, at, at some point in everyone's life, they, they discover music. And I love music so much. And I so. think that's right. And it's, uh, it's something that... Um, you know, we consume uh, into our body, so it really feels like it becomes part of us, yeah. and it becomes part of our identity, so it's a great window into the past in that regard. Yeah, definitely, and so that's why I wanted to have you on, because you just published a book. It's titled uh, Cold War Country, mm -hmm. How Nashville's Music Row and the Pentagon Created the Sound of American Patriotism. Yes. Uh, so congrats on that. Thank you. I know getting a book published is, you know, a monumental effort. Uh, it can take a lot of years to do that, but um, yeah, I just wanted to talk to you a bit about that. So what is the book about and yep. what inspired you to write it? Yeah, so the book is generally about, well, when, when you hear that title or if I say, you know, it's about the, the connection between the country music industry and the United States military, people have a kind of narrative in place about what that means. And, and I think they're justified in having that because people are likely familiar. If you're familiar with country music and its politics at all, you're probably familiar with people like Toby Keith, mm -hmm. uh, Lee Greenwood. Uh, the, these artists who, who tend to put out songs that have this um, real patriotic fervor to them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, God bless the USA in the case of Lee Greenwood or the angry American right, in the wake of 9-11 from someone like uh, Toby Keith. Um, and my book shows that that doesn't, that connection between the country music industry and the military doesn't just come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that's a relationship that has been built over really beginning at, at the tail end of uh, the 1940s. Uh, my, my book really begins in earnest in the 1950s and shows how uh, people within the country music industry linked up with people within the military to create a reciprocal business relationship, essentially. Mm -hmm. Now that business relationship has a real, uh, has real political ramifications for uh, the South, I would say, for the United States as a whole, and specifically for the country music industry. Sure. Yeah. yeah, and it's, um, you know, I think when people think about a history professor, they're thinking of something a lot older. But it's so interesting that, I mean, this is pretty recent. It's within yeah. the century. Um, and so, yeah, and studying music and the military, it's just such an interesting research project. And so, yeah, I mean, how did you do the research? Yeah. And what's some cool stuff you figured out? Yeah, so I, I came to this topic because I was actually writing a, a, a research paper while I was in graduate school at the University of Virginia about a black country singer 
named O.B. McClinton. Mm. Now, he's from Senatobia, Mississippi, so not, not too far yeah. from here. Uh, and I was fascinated about, you know, the story of a black country music singer. Many people know Charlie Pride, but maybe not a lot of people know O.B. McClinton or some of the other uh, black country artists who are, I would say, maybe coming to our, our uh, minds a little more uh, prominently these days, thanks to Beyonce and her mm. foray into country music. But anyhow, so this was 2016, I would say. And I started digging into O.B. McClinton's story. And what I found was that not only was he into country music, but he really discovered his talent for that while he was serving in the U.S. Air Force mm -hmm. stationed on Okinawa. And I found that fascinating yeah. because uh, here's this kind of con self-contained environment of a, of a military installation, and he's able to find his way to country music this way and find his talent for singing it. Now, he goes on to a, a real, real career when he gets out of the U.S. Air Force. But part of that career is that he also um, played on U.S. Air Force recruitment radio shows mm. that were country music themed. Sure. And so I, this was kind of a light bulb moment where I thought, oh, there's country music recruitment vit, uh, uh, radio shows. Right. Uh, and so I started digging into that story. And this led me to this economic story that I tell in the book about how um, these studio owners and producers in Nashville linked up with people in the Defense Department to create country music recruitment. Um, and when they did that, uh, this, this, at the same time that they're creating these recruitment programs, the country music industry is also figuring out that they have sort of captive audiences in these um, U.S. service members who are mm -hmm. stationed abroad, and they want to sell more country records, push their music to audiences around the globe. And what better way to do that than U.S. military during the Cold War? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think country music definitely has that connotation of, um, you know, it's a national kind of sound. And right. It, it embraces American ideals. Yeah. And so that's what you're researching. And, and so, yeah, it's so interesting that other people are aware of that. They're plugging it mm -hmm. in and making those connections. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what would you say are the overall claims of the book? Yeah, so I, I, I kind of break it down into three, uh, three stories that I'm telling. One of those stories is an economic story, and I, I've kind of laid that out already. The way that these business actors within the country industry linked up with the, with the Defense Department and said, hey, this is a great way to sell our products. And to, to, uh, to your point about making it a sort of American brand, mm -hmm. Uh, this is a great way to brand yourself as a patriotic genre, right. uh, d especially during the 1950s mm -hmm. and 60s, right, is to make yourself really closely connected with the U.S. military. So that's part of the economic story I tell. And, and, and I should say, part of that also, uh, to, to prove how effective this was, uh, by 1968-69, the European PXs, so those stores on military installations mm -hmm. around the globe, are selling more country records than any other genre. Interesting. So they know that they have, you know, this is a lucrative business partnership that they've encountered mm -hmm. here. So p that's part of the economic story I'm telling. Um, there's also a sort of social history uh, story that I'm telling in which I'm able to dig into the individual stories of people who served. Um, and one of the things that really struck me over and over again in the archive was the way that m so many country musicians entered the military, and maybe they had a fledgling interest in music, maybe they played the guitar a little bit, but the actual downtime uh, mm -hmm. that they could enjoy while they were serving in the military uh, allowed them to cultivate their artistry even more and really find their craft. So, and here I'm talking about people like Johnny Cash, Tom T. Hall, um, George Strait, all of those people got their start writing songs oh, wow. while serving in the military. Mm. So I talk about it as a kind of incubator for creativity mm. for these musicians. Um, and, and that's it's, it's an interesting story because um, a lot of these guys grew up in rural spaces, often on farms, uh, and they just didn't have the kind of time and, and leisure time sure. to, to do this. And so now all of a sudden they're sitting around the, the barracks bored yeah. and they pick up the guitar and start writing songs. Mm. And that becomes a springboard into professionalization for them. Yeah, wow. Yeah. It's almost paradoxical. You think they would have more free time when they're not out at service. Maybe but. so, but yeah. And, and you know, they're, through things like the Special Services Division of, uh, of the U.S. Armed Forces, they're able to essentially rent uh, instruments so they can go mm -hmm. check out a guitar right. from, and, and spend some time with it without having a huge commitment. So again, it's another way of, of a sort of stepping stone into that artistry for them. Yeah. And the third story I tell is a political one. So 
again, when we think about, to go back to that Lee Greenwood, Toby Keith kind of narrative, uh, when we think about country music's politics, it's often branded as this super, super patriotic, defined as the uh, defined as a devotion to the military, mm -hmm. right? And that's often branded as a conservative position. And so, what I want to show is that um, country music doesn't it doesn't lean con the, or country music artists don't lean conservative necessarily just because that's part of country music culture that, that comes out of nowhere, but in fact was a result of this economic relationship mm -hmm. going right. back to the 1950s. So by the time we get to Vietnam, um, the country music industry has found such a lucrative partner here, it can't break with the military and express you know, widespread dissent uh, when it comes to the military. It has, it has its business relationship intact, and so it's made its bed here. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that is so interesting, and I, I, so much of what you're saying has so much relevance, like today, just with things like Beyonce sure. getting into country music and some of the more recent songs that are um, very explicitly political. Sure. Um, yeah, and so I think your research is, is having a moment right now, and so that's so cool. But I want to hear from you. How would you say this collaboration so long ago, how does it still affect American music and culture? Yeah, I think it's created expectations about the politics of country music. Uh, and a lot of people, because of just kind of inertia, accept that story, mm -hmm. uh, that country music is this uh, very conservative political space. It's a very white space, mm -hmm. if we believe that story. But as I hope my book is showing, it, it's more complicated than that. Right. In fact, there are more, there's a, a lot more political diversity within country music than it's often given credit for. And mm -hmm. I think Beyonce is, is showing that as well, if I can put myself on this, in the same conversation right. for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, it's showing that in a racial way. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. I mean. Um, and, and I've heard that, you know, the something like these are the artists Nashville isn't pushing right sure, now. Sure, absolutely. So there's all these different brands of country music. It's not just a monolith. But, absolutely. But this is a part of it. Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me thank today. You, thank you, Sam. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that was a great conversation. And thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Vision. We'll see you next time.